something beautiful to me about people who were abused as kids is that the desire for love and tenderness stays alive in us even when other people leave us even when we piece together the thinnest little bits of relationships out of whatever happens to be available we agree to these kind of time filler relationships and we try to play it cool when the emptiness inside of those relationships becomes too obvious to avoid and still we feel love and we want to be loved there's an urge in hurt people who pretend to be okay in these relationships to act like the crumbs they're getting are enough. They should be enough, right? Have you done this? When you get treated like you're not important, do you turn against yourself and wonder, is it, is it just me? Am I expecting too much? Am I too needy? Am I unreasonable? Am I just gonna get abandoned again if I say something? That's the voice of the trauma in you. The real feeling under that is not needy. It's a natural tendency toward love and you might settle for less, but if you're feeling that sense of injustice in your heart, that when you opened your life to this other person, you deserved something better than casual treatment. Now it's true, maybe you didn't choose well or you didn't set boundaries the way an untraumatized person might have done it, but it's the most beautiful part of you that craves that love. It keeps coming back like a dandelion through the crack in the sidewalk, and it comes back because no matter what happened to you in the past, no matter how much this has warped your path and squashed your expectations, you were made to be loved. And accepting crumbs might have been how you survived, but now I wanna help you change those terms. No more crumbs. And I wanna talk about that today, all right? So my letter is from a woman I'll call Celine, and she writes, Hi, Anna. Please can you help me decide whether I'm in a healthy relationship or not? because I can see strong arguments for both. I have CPTSD from childhood, during which I was bought and sold for sex. <sighs> Most of the time was spent at parents' homes and going to school, but then sometimes I spent time away, up to three months abroad with abusers. This has left me with lots of self-esteem, trust, and shame issues, as well as issues around money. It might be relevant that to this day, I'm 49, she says, I still can't decide if my parents are evil or just weak and victimized. I know they treated me very badly. I'm circling a couple things with my fairy pencil because I'm gonna read through, I'm gonna come back to some key points because I think I can help you with this, Celine. Okay. Three years ago, I moved to a new place. I had a responsible job working long hours in a different town, so I didn't get to know many of my neighbors beyond a surface level. The man who is now my boyfriend, I'll call him Anthony, is my next door neighbor. I first saw Anthony when I was struggling outside with something as I was moving in three years ago and we caught each other's eye through his kitchen window. He went away. A different neighbor saw me struggling and came and helped. I don't know if it was that Anthony didn't notice I was stuck or if he chose not to help. When I asked him about it, he didn't seem to remember. Anthony and I had a drink together one night and although I liked him, it didn't lead to anything, and anyway, I was too busy with my job to think about pursuing a relationship. We finally got together eight months ago after my job came to an end in difficult circumstances. It was summer. I started spending a lot of time outdoors in my garden, and he was working outside on his windows, and I felt there was a very strong sexual attraction. I hadn't been with a man for 16 years, and I didn't think I'd ever want to again, so it was a wonderful surprise for me to find I could still feel this way. We had a drink together outside a few times and chatted. He invited me around to his place for dinner one evening, and he cooked a nice meal. I asked him if it was a date, and he said no. I invited him back to my place for dinner a couple of weeks later. I was flirting pretty hard, but he didn't make any move. At the end of the night, I asked him why he hadn't, and that's when he finally kissed me for the first time. The next time we met, we did a lot of kissing. I wanted to take it further, but I was scared about how I'd react if we did. This went on for a couple of weeks until I was wondering why he hadn't taken the next step. When he finally made a move, I panicked and said we hadn't even been out on a date. He said we'd go out on a date, and we did immediately. We walked to the closest restaurant, a place I know now he doesn't even like. We had dinner. At times he seemed completely disinterested in me, even bored. When the bill came, I had my card ready to pay my half, but he didn't reach for his and allowed me to pay. 
I feel uncomfortable about this. Not least because I just lost my job, but I didn't say anything. We went back to his place and had sex. The sex was great, he was gentle and considerate, and he still wanted to hang out with me the next day. He told me he'd liked me since he first met me, but thought I was unobtainable. We'd been dating ever since. Over the eight months, he's taken me to meet his parents three times and most of his friends many times. After we'd been dating for about six weeks, he told me his ex-girlfriend had texted him and told him to let me know they are still friends. Secretly, I hated this at once, but forced myself to focus on the fact that I'm still friends with two of my exes and don't have any feelings for them, and why should that be any different for him? At our age, we all have baggage. They've been split up for four years. One day, when we were out walking, he got a text and told me, although I hadn't asked, that his ex had his record player and wanted him to collect it. Around three months later, he received another text and told me the exact same words. I asked about this, and he didn't really respond. A few days later, he took me with him to his ex to collect the record player, but he didn't tell her I was coming and didn't invite me out of the car and parked up the street so we didn't even see each other, and I wondered if the trip was to cover up a lie. About four months into our relationship, while he was away, he texted me that he loved me, but when he returned home and I asked him about it, he was quite gruff and said he'd already told me how he felt. Since then, he has told me again three times, but only one of those was without me saying it first. Sometimes he's so loving and tender with me, but sometimes he seems distant, almost cold. Then I noticed his ex was texting him a lot. His phone was constantly going while we were together, and he started setting it to silent. When I caught sight of him reading the texts, I saw they were very, very long. When we spoke about it, I said I understood they were still friends, and he said, when I say we're friends, we live together, lived together, and didn't finish the sentence. I took it to mean that he cared about her because she has serious mental health issues and no friends. Then he accepted a job from her, he's a builder, which meant he'd be working at her house for four days. I said I didn't feel comfortable about him doing that, but he said it was only for the money. My problem really started the other day when it was Anthony's birthday. We were talking about his plans, and he said it was awkward for him to have to act in a cool manner towards people because I might not be okay with them. And I said if he wanted to invite her along with the group, I would be okay with that. He said he would, but he didn't think she'd come. She came. <laughs> she stayed out with us all night. We went back to friend's house for drinks afterwards. She was the life and soul of the party, <laughs> buying shots and charming everyone. I approached her and we chatted and she said Anthony had only ever dated one other girl before her and she felt strange and bad seeing him with me. When she left, she shared a taxi with a single friend of his she'd met that evening. I was relieved when she left, but I felt pleased that I'd handled it without losing my center. One of Anthony's friends asked him about her leaving with a mate, as saying, how would you feel if those two got together? And Anthony, who was drunk, replied very slowly and decisively, I loved her and I still do love her as a person. There was a bit of a stunned silence in the room. I tried to make light of it and asked if he would got cut off mid-sentence and another Friend tried to help with that, but Anthony said no. I didn't want to make a fuss in front of his friends or ruin his birthday, so I said nothing. The next day he was hung over, and it still didn't seem like a good time to ask him about it, but we met outside and I couldn't hide that I was upset. I told him, you're supposed to fall out of love with your ex before you start dating someone again. He just shook his head and said no, that I was wrong, that it's me, and, hug and he hugged me, and I asked him if he's with me because she is very challenging and I'm very passive and eager to please. And he said no, but he didn't explain. I was desperate to be confronted and I allowed myself to be calmed by him, but I don't think it really addressed my issue. It feels like his heart is hers. He's always stumbled over saying that he loves me, but when he said it about her, he was full of calm conviction. She seems like a much better match for him as I'm still signed off at work and have to have no financial success or family or many friends. Am I being too needy about this? Is it okay if he loves us both? 
I don't want to sabotage something good, but I also don't want to settle for a half love. And I don't know which one this is. Celine. Okay, Celine, I got gotcha. you. Let's go through a couple things you told me in your letter. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll, let me just go to some key points. So first of all, bought and sold. It's interesting to me how you said this so matter-of-factly. And that sometimes you were going to school and being at home with your parents, and then sometimes you'd go to some foreign country for a few months to be trafficked. And yes, of course you have self-esteem, trust, and shame issues and money issues. Boy, you just said that so effortlessly and like, yes, there's the background. And I know what it is to sort of compartmentalize something like that just so you can get on with the story and not be defined by it. So I'm proud of you to not be defined by it. But oh my gosh, what a background. What struck me is that you said, to this day, you can't decide if your parents are evil or just weak and victimized. So if they were trafficking you, honey, they're not victims. They are not the victims. I don't think any person is really evil, but they go to an evil place and they do evil things and they sometimes never get out of it. And since you're in confusion about this, it sounds like they're either gone or they certainly never took responsibility for what they did to you, which is one of the gravest abuses you could possibly do to another person and by your own parents. So I'm really sorry that happened. And I'm going to go ahead and set that aside and just let that be an understanding of why, just like with so many of us, some of this stuff is hard for you to detect and navigate. Okay. So three years ago, you moved into a new place. You worked all the time. You didn't really know your neighbors, but you were struggling outside once with something that was very heavy. And this guy, Anthony, who's now your boyfriend, saw you and just took off. <laughs> and sometimes I think that the red flag shows up in the first second. It was red flag at first sight, right? He saw you struggling and he took off and another neighbor helped you, but who'd you get together with the guy who took off? And I just see that, you know, that's, you were primed to be able to tolerate that and question only if maybe you're being too hard on people when they treat you that way, okay? So I would say flat out, if a guy sees you struggling with something heavy and just walks away, that would be a red flag. No, no relationship there. That's not who you want to be with because and not just because of gender, like anybody, what a partnership is, is showing up in that sort of spirit of helpfulness and support towards another person. And when they struggle, that's why two people are better than one, because individual struggles really need a friend sometimes. So he showed you who he was with that. But as you say, he said he didn't even remember. I wonder. That also kind of echoes what we heard from him later on in your story. I, oh, I don't know. I'm unaware. You know, I'm just like this hapless guy just bumbling along. I don't know what's happening. So, all right. So he's your next door neighbor, always complicated. Um, and you had a drink together one night and you liked him, but it didn't lead to anything and you were busy um, and you didn't want to pursue a relationship. But finally you got together eight months ago after your job ended. So you weren't so busy and it was summer and you were outdoors in your garden. He was working outside. Kind of sounds like one of those movies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and an attraction blossomed. And yes, that's a happy thing. You still get attracted and that's wonderful. That's, that's life springing eternal in you. It comes back. So that's a good thing. That force of nature in you, that's a good thing. You had a drink together outside a few times and chatted. So I'm just going to comment like it is so normal for people to have drinks together, right? But if you have CPTSD and if you have trouble with boundaries, I would just suggest don't drink. Don't drink on dates or maybe don't drink at all. The thing about alcohol is it distorts your perception and lowers your inhibitions, which, may, which is what CPTSD already does. So CPTSD plus, plus alcohol equals CPTSD behaviors. That's what I'm saying. If drinking is not normally a problem for you and you're in a very safe situation with people you trust and there's no like emotional landmines around you, having drinks together with people is not a problem. Um, but doing it on a date, doing it when you like somebody is basically just saying, I don't want these horrible inhibitions and boundaries and stuff. I don't want them. I just, I just want the wind to blow where it blows and see where it goes. And I'm letting go here. And that, I know a lot, of, a lot of people, especially you heavy drinkers out there are going to give me pushback on that, but it's true. So I didn't drink for eight years. 
Um, I'm not an alcoholic, but I didn't drink for eight years. It started when I quit smoking cigarettes. I knew that I would have to do that. I realized what a huge difference it was making in my ability to make conscious choices in my life, to stay out of sick relationships, and I loved it. And I stayed not drinking until my kids were, I don't know, in school, basically. It was, you know, I ended up having, you know, alcohol-free pregnancies. There were so many things. No cigs, no alcohol, yay me, right? I felt really good about that. And then I reintroduced it and it wasn't a problem and it's something I hardly ever do. To this day, the way my CPTSD and my wounds interact with drinking is if I'm already sad about something, it's gonna make me more sad. And I know some people have kind of a different response to it, like it lifts sadness or it heals depression. Not me, if I'm depressed, I'm going down, so I gotta stay away from it. It's only for super safe, happy times and not very much. That's me, okay. So you got together, you had drinks, you went to his place, a couple later at your place, you were flirting. You asked him like, what's going on? You don't, you're not making a move and then finally he kissed you. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that as a beginning of a relationship. It's just that now that we know where it went, we can sort of see that he was planting the flag of somebody who's like, not taking responsibility for initiating a relationship. If he had actually pursued you, asked you out, paid, yes, paid for your dinner, all of that stuff, it would be him volunteering for that role in your life. But the dates, it was always you kind of having to gently, I don't think you overdid it at all. I'm proud of you for asking questions, but you always had to ask, is this a date? You know, you had to put your credit card down. So you were sort of facilitating this thing toward dating, and it seems like, it seems like he didn't have the driver motivation to kind of push that forward. And he let you into his life, he did. But he didn't do that crucial thing, and most people need that. I certainly have found in men, they need to have a piece of the relationship early on that they have to reach for it, that that activates their ability to fall in love. And if they don't get that, it seems very likely that they're gonna fall in love. And I've had so many opportunities to test my hypothesis, okay? So then you got together, there was a whole bunch of kissing, but he still didn't advance it towards sex, and you wondered if something was wrong. You kind of thought, you know, it would be his role to sort of go, come on, let's take it to the next level, and he didn't. And I hear you about that, and that it does indicate something. There's something he's not telling you about why he's holding back. Um, but I would just say for one reason or another, he didn't feel right about it or he would have. So then when he finally did make a move, you panicked, you said, wait, we haven't even been out on a date. And so this is like the classic relationship malaise of our time. There's a whole pattern here. This happens to so many people, but there you are. You've been seeing somebody a lot. You've been making out for weeks. It's time for it to go to the next level in your mind. And yet you've never been on a date. Like what is up with that? I just want to go in and put in a big, advocation I want to say go on dates be somebody who requires being courted be on somebody who goes on dates see if you take my dating course this is where it starts you have to like write down what do you want and then I help you set up a slow path of, of structured dating so that you can be open and receptive to what it is you actually want and and speak up for what you want and be honest and open about it but not do it so fast, not try to manufacture this great relationship out of somebody you barely know. People without trauma do that all the time. We do it too, but for us the consequences are so terrible because we lose our boundaries so easily because of the attachment wound, and then because of the abandonment wounds, you know, once we find ourselves in some sort of, you know, crap relationship, we can't leave. We won't leave, we'll do anything to make it work. We'll continue to like dumb ourselves down, stop having standards, blame ourselves. We'll do all that stuff so that we don't have to face the end. So many of us do that. There's no shame in it. It's just that when you're ready to be happy, it's time to stop doing that. So when you said we need a date, he said, great, we'll go on a date. And you walked right out to a restaurant that he didn't even like, like he couldn't even be bothered to do something he would enjoy. It was like, here, here's your date. And you paid for it. And there was something icky in that. That didn't feel good to me. You put your card out. You thought it would be Dutch. I don't even recommend you do that. A lot of people will say I'm not feminist. I'm totally feminist. I'm so feminist that I don't like getting jerked around by men. <laughs> and I allow them, if they want to go on a date, to pay. And I wouldn't pay for a first date with a guy. I just wouldn't. And when I stopped doing that, things totally changed in my dating life. It sends a strong signal. If you have a pattern of compromising yourself, of um, having to do all the work, having to ask all the questions. Just like, do something new for yourself and just like, don't do that. Don't ask guys out, don't pay. 
Just let them come to you. Let them demonstrate to you that they would do that for you. Let them show you what their intentions are by that ritualized action. There's nothing old fashioned about that. It's totally lovely to have somebody take you out to dinner. Very nice. And of course, you don't owe them anything for all the guys who are going to go, oh, well, well, women just, you know, take advantage and want the dinner. It's not true. It's not true. It's called courtship. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. And we kind of lost it in the sea of everything else going on. And we can bring it back for ourselves without having to change other people. And I promise you, when you hold yourself in that position of, of a self-respecting person who, who will date, but needs to be asked, <laughs> needs to be treated properly, then you will be asked and treated properly. Don't even worry. Okay. You're going to repel people who would only give you something less than that. You're going to shine to people who would give you something more than that. All right. That's how it works. So you had the dinner, you had sex, you say it was great. And he wanted to hang out with you the next day. And then he told you something that sounds really manipulative in light of what we know about him. He said he'd liked you since he first met you, but thought you were unobtainable. So, okay, maybe that's true. But that doesn't seem why he was so reluctant to get involved with you. I think it's better explained by his entanglement with his ex. You know, that's what somebody who is torn up inside does. They feel lonely. They might not want to be with some ex, but they feel lonely and they want to have a companion, but they really can't give themselves. They're not emotionally available. They're not emotionally available to the ex or to you. And that's a limbo that people can live in for a long time. I've done it. I think it's really a common CPTSD thing. I don't know if he has CPTSD. It's not really important here. It's just that, yeah, he thought you were unobtainable. I appreciate that he introduced you to his parents and his friends often. That was, that's cool. That means he was open to you, but not emotionally, right? So, okay. So one of the rationales we could have is he has an avoidant personality and it's just not his style, but he does feel that way about you. That's certainly possible, but avoidant people are very difficult to be with. I wouldn't recommend it unless they're really like aware that it affects you, aware that it's a style. Um, they're working on meeting you halfway. That is a good thing to do. You know, you might have like a more anxious attachment style where you're always like trying to check and take the temperature and do they like me? And he's more like trying to hold it back here. So I'll tell you a secret. A, you can still have a good relationship with an avoidant person, but as the person who's anxious and kind of chasing after them, it's better to stop chasing because it's the chase on them that makes them feel anxious. It makes them feel like they have to pull away. So sometimes all the questions make them pull away. But in your telling of this, you barely ever asked him anything. I think that your questions and your timing of questions was important, minimal, true, real. So I back you up on that. If he couldn't deal with that, I just think he has a serious availability problem. I don't like that he was gruff with you about asking whether he loved you after the first time he told you and he told you on the phone. So that's what it seems like. I noticed that his loving stuff happens from a distance. You know, he got all weepy about the ex when he, she wasn't in the room, you know, and then he got worried about your feelings when you said, I think that you belong with her, you know, <laughs> something's wrong here. Then he showed you, he told you he loved you when he was traveling. So that's what an avoidant person might do. Like they can express those feelings when there's a huge space between you, but when day to day, they can't. And this is so painful for somebody who's been abandoned and traumatized like you have, you know, to be left in another country and abused while your parents just waited and I don't know, got money off of it. Oh, good Lord. That's just so bad. I could just see how it kind of like your way that you survived that was to shut down the belief that that could be evil, um, to think that you, yeah, that you don't deserve to be treated in a normal vanilla way, either as a little girl or as a 49 year old woman, that this is just like vanilla. Vanilla is very good. And by vanilla, I mean, just like the customary, normal cultural way that people go on a date or raise children, right? You never, oh, I'm not going to keep going back to your childhood. It's just, it's too upsetting. It's too upsetting. Um, but it's certainly, you can feel the damage coming up in the way you question your judgment here. 
and I just think you're doing amazing. One day you're out walking and he got a text and she said, come get your record player. Three months later, he gets the same text. He said the same thing and you put that in italics. So I think you suspected he was lying. I, I guess benefit of the doubt, maybe he just didn't get the record player the first time. But what's coming through to me loud and clear is that this woman is trying to hook him in right now and it's kind of working. But she's constantly manipulating and texting and she has a, she's emotionally upset and she needs him and the record player and the record player oh my gosh it's still here you have to get it and then what he did was codependently not take you to meet her not let her know you were there make you have to deal with that like he's afraid to set her off so you had mentioned just very slightly here that she has some kind of emotional problems so what is she like a borderline who just is so charming and wonderful and nice and then just is going to kill herself or something that's the impression i get so it's easy to get held hostage by those people um but i guess after on his birthday when he was drunk and there it is alcohol and it will exaggerate all sorts of messy thoughts so i mean who among us doesn't sometimes bump into an ex and feel nostalgic and go oh gosh i really love that person Saying it out loud in front of you and all of his friends was totally sloppy and uncool and definitely another red flag. If you want to start your life again in the relationship department, I would invite you to set a new standard. End all your friendships with exes, even if you don't have feelings for them. End those relationships and be prepared to meet somebody who also is not entangled with any exes. That's, those are ideal conditions. Very, very good for meeting somebody so that you can very quickly discern, like, is this person for me? Is this relationship what I'm looking for? And there's not just a whole bunch of side drama about other people and questions about that. The presence of exes means usually emotional unavailability. And whether it's somebody whose um, ex, whose parent of their child is constantly at war with them, that might not be their fault right now, but it creates unavailability. It's like a whole thing you have to take on. It's a notorious relationship killer or if they have a whole bunch of friends, people they used to sleep with, and you're all supposed to be cool with it. I'm not cool with it. When I finally got honest with myself about that, I was just like, no, I'm totally not cool with that. And I was dishing it out, but I didn't like taking it. So that's what I changed in my life when I got ready to have a relationship for real, to stop all the crap relationships and prepare the way for the real thing is I stopped having friends where there was any kind of vibe at all, anything that would cause my potential mate to feel jealous and the man showed up. I'm now married to him and one of the things he announced to me is that, and I wasn't even expecting this, I wasn't even very clear about it myself at the time and he just said something I'm gonna do while we're dating is just so you know, I'm not hanging out with exes, I'm not like hanging out with other women, having lunch with them or anything. I want, I'm here to find out if you're the one for me. I was <laughs> so direct, right? If you're the one for me, and um, I'm not going to clutter it up with a bunch of things that might make you feel jealous because that's going to disrupt our process of figuring out if we're the real thing. So that was heavenly. I loved that. It didn't make us instantly get together. It was still like a, a, quite a process over several years. But I never had to deal with that. And to this day, I don't have to deal with it. And what a relief it is. And now I look around like it's so common in our culture to just be like, oh, yeah, you're supposed to be friends with all these people. Now, sometimes there's a purpose to doing that because of children, usually. Um, children, perhaps an illness or something in an ex. So sometimes there's a purposeful reason to stay connected with them. But if it causes jealousy, just know you're going to pay the price in terms of emotional connection. And there it is. Okay. And you don't have to settle for that. So, um, yeah, so she was texting him, she was drawing him in, then he agreed to do a job for her. And I just, I don't know, I, I smell a rat. This, this little job she needed done, built for her, it just sounds like her trying to get him to hang around. It definitely does, and he said yes, and I wouldn't like it either. And I think at that point I might have been very clear, no way, but here we are. So then he had his birthday, then he said he loved her. It does seem, yeah. Then she comes and she was so charming, right? And. I'll just tell you something. If, if you ever are the ex and you come to the party of a man and his current partner, take a back seat. <laughs> Don't be the life and soul of the party. That's totally inappropriate. You take a back seat. If you're an ex, man or woman, I don't care who you are, it is inappropriate to come in and try to steal the show. That is hurtful, manipulative behavior. Don't do it. So I'm not lecturing you. I'm really lecturing her and she's not watching, but 
that is really lame. I feel for you how awful you must have felt that whole time, just getting through it, muscling through. You said, okay, sure, honey, blah, okay. And then, and he didn't think she came. I thought your language was so funny. He didn't think she'd come. She came. <laughs> And she stayed out all night and everybody was drinking and it was so fun. And then, and then what does she do? She takes off with his friend in a taxi. And by this time, I'm so like convinced that she's just there trying to, she's so manipulative. So she's trying to hook him and make him jealous about taking off with his friend. His chain was yanked. Surprise. You know, I almost don't even fault him for that part of it. But, you know, he's been setting it up. So he was drunk and one of his friends said, how would you feel if they got together? Cause it looked like they were. And he, he was stricken, right? He was stricken and he's like, I loved her. I always loved her as a person. He tried to qualify, but we know what he's saying. His love has been activated just as she designed. And the reason he's not with her uh, is what you mentioned here. And I believe it is that is her emotional instability. It sounds like it was a drama shit show <laughs> and it ended four years ago and she still is trying to hook him in. And he hasn't put boundaries around his life yet to move on from that. And he's ruining it with you. So here we are. So the next day he was hung over and you didn't think it was a good time to talk. I love your judgment. Not good to talk to a drunk person, maybe not even a hungover person, but you met outside and you couldn't hide that you were upset. And you know, when you're neighbors with somebody, yeah, what are you going to do? Right? You have to like see everybody's comings and goings. And then when it doesn't work out, somebody's got to move. So these things happen. I happen to know, <laughs> but it's really, really hard when it gets to this like painful point. So you asked if, if he was just with you because she was very challenging and you're passive and eager to please. And he said, no. And you were desperate to be comforted and you allowed yourself to be calmed by him, but you don't think it, he didn't address the issue. And that sounds like his deal. He gives you just enough crumbs to go, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's you. But he doesn't come forward and go, I'm so sorry I did that. That must have been horrible for you. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm totally serious about you and I don't want you to have to feel jealous. That is what you needed to hear. And he also didn't go, listen, you know what? I'm just kind of here for convenience. So take it or leave it, <laughs> which is what his actions are saying. He's there for convenience. You're there. He likes you well enough. He kind of loves you, but he, he's not in a place where he can give himself to you. I promise you this thing with the ex is not going to work out whatever happens. It's not going to work out. He's got emotional availability issues and you're with him. And it's so understandable that you would be drawn to somebody like that sometimes. And especially cause you had been sort of avoiding relationships for so many years. Sometimes the person who only has a little bit to give, well, we can only handle a little bit. So it seems like it will work, but it turns out that there is that little dandelion of hope in you that you are capable of love and you would like to be loved. And I encourage you, Celine, to listen to that part of yourself and honor it, honor that part of you, let it come back. I know that it opens the door to a world of pain and problems potentially, but this is your heart's desire talking to you, drawing you in and with a little bit of structure and a little bit of conscious decision-making before you're in a relationship, you can follow a much different path and it can be better than this. You're in a pr predicament now because you live there and you're going to see him. It sounds like, I know you're out of work right now, but it sounds like moving and going to a new place would be good and cutting ties with this person. It's progress. Uh, I, I don't want you to beat yourself up. You had a relationship that was a half relationship, but perhaps it's time to set your sights higher on the whole thing. Just like real love. Okay. So if you're watching this and you feel like you were affected by trauma when you were a kid and it's affecting your dating life, check yourself against these symptoms that I list in my relationships quiz. You can get that on the free tools page of my website. That's linked down below. And if you want to watch another video about how parental abuse and neglect can prime you to be a secondary partner to somebody you love, then I've got this video lined up for you right here and I will see you very soon.